having the opportunity to work at the British Museum was a, just a remarkable experience and getting to know its Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander collections there, which aren't or weren't then broadly known outside of a small number of people. And through working with colleagues in Britain and various communities here and museums and universities in Australia, I believe, and my colleagues in the British Museum would attest to this, that the understanding of those collections has been completely transformed in 10 years to something that now people realise is really quite remarkable and special. Well, the British Museum has about 6,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island objects, plus photographs, drawings, and other examples of Australian material culture in the prints and drawings department, and also coins and money. So uh, Australian objects are spread in many different departments. In fact, one of the most interesting acquisitions I think I acquired for the museum in my time there was a small plastic card, now in the Department of Coins and Money, which is an example of the cashless welfare card that was introduced into use in Australia, particularly targeted for use in remote, some remote communities as a form of welfare control. And so the museum, I think, few people understand that the British Museum continues to acquire contemporary material, many new pieces of artwork, Judy Watson, Alec Tapoti, people from around the country. But as well as the 6,000 objects in the British Museum from about early 1800 to the present day, through work I did surveying Aboriginal collections throughout the United Kingdom, there are about 75 or more institutions that hold these cultural materials from small towns, big cities, and totaling in approximately 40,000 items. So what's remarkable is that in many small towns, they might have a world cultures collection in their museum, and it might include 20 or 50 or 100 items of Aboriginal culture from Australia, often of which they know very little about. So part of my job was helping them understand what they have and documenting that, and through a publication we worked on, making these collections known so more people can come and study them. In the UK, there are a number of big projects going on supported by central funding to look at how can the UK open up its heritage to the world through digital transformation. And uh, although there are various projects happening, the key to this is making collections discoverable in some form of digital fashion. And uh, some of the projects involve community um, input into documentation and into storytelling. From a research perspective, because museums like the British Museum are an important research institution, um, it's important that the information about its collections is not just a summary one line item painting by so and so on a date. The database, which is available in a public form, has an incredible amount of detail about the particular objects. So it's used by people all around the world to find out more information and each of those records has a feedback function. So um, I re in, in the area of my responsibilities, for example, I would get uh, feedback on records from Australia and Oceania, and it might be someone from New Zealand seeing their grandfather in a photograph and say, that's my grandfather and he lived here and he did that. Or even one day a villager in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, he said, oh, that shield from my village, I'd like to know more. And so once a institution puts its, its collections available online, it really does open these collections up to the world. And apart from natural history collections in Australia, that's not happening here at, at any level like that. So I think that's a big challenge for Australian cultural institutions and the need, it demonstrates the need for new cultural digital infrastructure here to allow this to occur right across Australia as a national collection to cover all the cultural institutions and their holdings here. There's so many possibilities. Uh, creative research, I think that there needs to be more funding because uh, you know Britain was the colonial power in Australia when many of these objects were collected. And um, I think it's very difficult for the British now to understand their colonial history in Australia and I, perhaps they don't see it as their responsibility because Australia became a federated nation in 1901. 
But for all these uh, cultural collections, I think Britain does have a collective responsibility to look at how can it as a nation and through its arts and cultural heritage policies uh, encourage more Aboriginal people to visit these collections, have discussions about them, funding so more of them can be more easily borrowed, and what are the programs and projects uh, to be discussed and devised so that First Nations here throughout Australia can decide in relation to their own part of these collections what they would like to see happen. <laughs>